<laughs> Am I, is it on? I don't see a light on this thing. Here. Oh, okay. okay. Well, I'm glad you can hear me. I don't want to lip sync up here. Nice to be with you folks again. I have a question to ask you. How many of you are cat lovers? Oh, dear. Do you mind if I tell a story about a cat? Okay. I read this the other day. I was thought it was really cute. It's been one when they had a cat, and she would just, she loved this cat. I mean, the cat was more to her than anything, but he didn't like cats. So one day she took a trip, and she was gone for a couple of weeks, and while she was gone, he got rid of the cat. I won't tell you how he got rid of the cat, but he got rid of the cat. So when uh, the wife returned, the cat wasn't there. And uh, my husband said, well, it must have run off. I, I, I don't know what happened to it. So he waited for a little bit of time and uh, she was just mourning over this cat. So he said, well, look, he said, I'll put an ad in the paper and I'll offer, I'll offer $50 for anyone that can find this cat. Well, he knew that the cat was no more. So he put it in the newspaper and of course there was no response. So he waited for a little bit longer and he said she was still sad. So he said, well, look, I'll put another ad in the paper and I'll offer $500 for anyone that can find the cat. And of course, there was no response. So a little bit later, he said, well, look, honey, I'll put in one more ad and I'll offer a thousand dollars for anyone who can find your cat. Of course, there was no response. Well, in the meantime, his friend, one of his friends saw the ad in the paper and he came to this man and he said, are you stupid? No cat is worth a thousand dollars. And he said, well, if you knew what I knew, you can be very, very generous. Do you get the point? He knew the cat was dead, so he could offer any amount that he wanted, and that obviously didn't work. Well, that was meant to be a joke, but I don't think it came across that much as a joke. If you'll turn with me this morning to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to read from verse 19. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. Get myself a little organized here. Don't need it, but I put it up here anyway. Well, the passage that we're going to read this morning is part of the Sermon on the Mount, and I thought I'd make just a couple of comments uh, about the Sermon on the Mount uh, to give it just a little bit of context because it's kind of an unusual portion in the New Testament. Um, the Sermon on the Mount is the first of five major discourses in, in the Gospel of Matthew. And there are different views about the Sermon on the Mount, which runs from chapter 5, as you probably know, through chapter 7. There are some who believe that it's kind of laying out a, a, a means of salvation, that if you can obey the Sermon on the Mount, you'll get enough credits in life, and in the end, God will let you into heaven. Obviously, that's a false premise, so we wouldn't accept that one. But there are two other views that are held among those that would co consider themselves dispensationalists and, or premillennial. And one group believes that the Sermon on the Mount has absolutely nothing to do with the church today. Uh, when Darlene and I were students in Bible school many years ago, uh, the man who took us through the life of Christ and through the Gospels eventually killed in a car wreck in 1961, but he gave a beautiful set of notes. And at the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, in large uppercase letters, he wrote, this passage has absolutely nothing to do with the church. Because his view was that Matthew 5 to 7 is a manifesto or a rule of life for the kingdom age, that period of time that will begin with the second advent of Christ and will run for a thousand years as we understand the scriptures to teach. And so this is a manifesto for that period of time. So Dr. Woodrum would say it has nothing to do with the way we live now. Well, I've kind of split it down the middle. And I think uh, I like the view better that was propagated by Stanley Toussaint. And you folks probably wouldn't recognize the name. But he did teach at Dallas many years. And he showed very, in my mind, quite conclusively 
that you could consider Matthew 5, 6, and 7 as what you might call an interim view. And if you'll read through uh, 5 through 7, you'll notice that a lot of verbs are in the future tense. So on the basis of that, Stanley Toussaint concluded that what we have in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is really um, spiritual principles, the way that we should be living in light of the coming kingdom. And there are, if there's an emphasis on rewards in this context. And so he's telling us how we should live now, because how we live now will be returned to us in terms of rewards during the millennial kingdom. Those are the crowns of the New Testament. That's the view that I like best. So when I read through all of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, I see them as spiritual principles that had an original meaning to the disciples who heard it, but the principles still remain true for us. And so by the help of the Spirit of God, you know we can follow these principles in light of the future coming of the Lord Jesus at the second advent. That's the first thing. The second thing is that I think that there is, to give a little context, there is one verse in the Sermon on the Mount that I believe provides kind of a total context for all that Jesus had to say. And if you'll just notice with me in your Bibles, back in chapter five, and we'll read just verse 20, because this will help us uh, kind of understand the whole context of the sermon. And Jesus said to his disciples and to some people who were listening from the crowds, he said, it, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And of course, the righteousness of the Pharisees was an external righteousness. So he was telling us here that what he's going to teach us in the Sermon on the Mount has to do with the inner life of the believer as opposed to external righteousness. And if you read all of those verses in that context, it will begin to make a great deal of sense to us. And what Jesus is doing, and particularly in chapter 5, is he's contrasting what he's teaching in authority with what the Pharisees were saying. He's not contrasting what he said to the Old Testament, but what do the Pharisees were saying, because they, they put all the emphasis on external righteousness, on their appearance. <clears throat> so Jesus is going really to divulge the way we really should live the Christian life by the aid of the Spirit of God in these in these verses. So with that little bit of background, let's read together from verse 19 of chapter 6. I think we'll read to the end of the chapter, although my thoughts this morning are just on the first part of the passage. So if you'll join me, we'll read from verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy or generous, your whole body will be full of light. And if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It does say money there, brothers and sisters, but the, the original word is a word that's, that's mammon in Aramaic. It really means possessions or wealth. So it's not just restricted to money in the context. And I'm not sure why the ESV translated it money, but that's the way a lot of people understand it. Verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? 
Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. <clears throat> Therefore, <clears throat> excuse me, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We'll finish our read there. Now, just a little bit more of context. In chapter six of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, the whole picture that he's trying to paint in this chapter is that we are children of our Heavenly Father. And if you mark in your Bibles as you read through chapter six, just underline the number of times he refers to the Father or to our Heavenly Father. So everything that he says in chapter six, he's wanting us to view it as if, you know, we are children of our Heavenly Father. And that's the context of, of what we read uh, together uh, here this morning. Now he begins this section, and maybe I should pose this as a question to you first. When Jesus told us to not lay up treasures on earth, what do you think he meant? Anyone have an idea what you think he means? I guess we don't understand what he means. Fall in love with things that we do have. Okay. 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 Anyone else? I think the verse of verse John says, not love the world or anything in the world. So it's not there to decide from this thing. Okay. Boasting what he has and does. Okay. okay. I'll tell you an interesting view. I don't subscribe to this view, but way back in the early days of the Brethren movement, going back to 1820, 1830, uh, one of the catalysts of that group was a man by the name of Anthony Norris Groves, who actually became the first missionary that went out without taking any pledges or promised support from Christians. And he ended up uh, in Iraq and served the Lord there. Then he went to India sometime later. But he was a very uh, prominent, uh, prosperous dentist in the western part of England. And he was, he was, his business was just booming in those days. Now, the, the amount of money he made then compared to today probably wasn't very much, but in those days, it was a lot of money. Well, he was converted to Christ. And he was traveling sometime between England and Dublin because he was studying at Trinity University in Dublin. And he just was, um, he wanted to be, uh, he wanted to be licensed in the Church of England so that he could become a missionary. But as he began to read his New Testament, he couldn't see any of that in the New Testament. And so one of his trips up to Dublin, he met a lawyer, uh, and his name was John uh, uh, J.G. Bellet. And one day he was saying to him, he said, I think that Christians can just meet together and they don't have to have a minister. They don't have to someone to dispense the elements. You know, we can just be together like we do here. And that was really kind of the beginning of a whole group of meetings that spread all over the world eventually. But one of the interesting things about Groves was that he and his wife, when, when he got married, they decided to take 10% of all of his earnings for that month. And they would go to a poor section of Exeter and they would distribute that among poor people. Well, after a while, they, they were so encouraged with what they were doing, they increased it. 
to 20%, then eventually to 30%, then eventually to 40%, and then 50%, 60%, 70%. So they were giving away basically 70% of all that he made because they only needed 30% to live on. So on the basis of his experience, I think, he interpreted this passage, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven to mean this, that Christians should give away all that they make with the exception of what they need to live on. So let's just suppose, for example, that we make $4,000 a month, well, $1,000 a week, let's, let's make it a little simpler. But we only need 400 of that to live for the week. So Gross would say that other $600 should be plowed back into the Lord's work or used for poor people or whatever. Now that was a view that was held quite prominently among some of the early brethren. In fact, Bill McDonald, was influenced by that. If you read his true discipleship, you'll see that there's a little bit of an inkling of that in his, what he felt. I think to me, that's kind of a little bit of an extreme view. So I think in thinking about what he meant by that statement, we need to think about what he doesn't mean. And I think the context will show he doesn't mean you can't have a savings account. And he doesn't mean that you can't plan in advance. The Bible never, never, I'm, I'm trying to say, never poo poo is being rich. And it doesn't laud people who give everything away. The Bible doesn't do that. The Bible is very balanced. In the Old Testament, you had Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They were all super wealthy in the days in which they lived. So he's not really telling us here, you know, that we can't plan in advance. He's not saying that you can't be rich. And I'll take you to a passage a little bit later, I think, that helps us understand that. So I'm thinking of a couple of verses, like I, I jotted down a couple from both the Old and the New Testament that teaches the principle of planning ahead. Go to the ant, O sluggard. He's talking about lazy people in the book of Proverbs. He says, observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief officer or ruler prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest because winter is coming. So God has so programmed an ant to prepare at the right time of the year because a rougher time of the year is yet coming. And then there's a very interesting passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 14. And here Paul wrote, here for the third time, I am ready to come to you and I will not be a burden to you. In other words, I'm not coming to get money from you. That's the, that's the point he's making. For I do not seek what is yours. So not, I'm not seeking your money. I'm not coming so you can give to me. But you, for children, he uses this illustration, for children are not responsible to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. Now that ver the principle in that verse is definitely that parents can prepare for their children. Of course, of course, knowing exactly what Paul meant is open to debate. Some people think that this means providing just for the time you're raising your children. And then when, they, when they're out from under our roof, they're on their own. That's the way it was in my day when I was... 18 years of age, I graduated from high school. It was time for me to move on. So I did. I moved out the same month that I graduated from high school. But there is another view. And this is a view that Bill, Bill McDonald didn't believe. He, 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 he believed that this passage was saying that, that believers should not save up money and put it in a trust or a will and leave to their children after they pass off the scene. Now, Bill lived that out in his life. I, I really don't think that's what this passage is teaching. I don't think it's teaching that you can't prepare it in advance. I don't think it's saying we can't have a savings account. I don't think he's saying that when, you know, you die, if you've got some assets in your estate and you want to leave it to your children, Scripture doesn't tell us one way or the other. Uh, my first trip to Burma many, many years ago, 
the Emmaus director was a man by the name of Ronnie Tinman Tan. And Ronnie had nine children. He had been a, he had been a, uh, a, uh, a repairman for aircraft. Uh, and he resigned from that and came back to Burma, to Myanmar today, in order to, to share the gospel with his fellow countrymen. And when I arrived and went to visit with him in the little small Emmaus office, in the course of our conversation, he said, oh, Charlie, said, I want to tell you something. He said, I've already told all my kids, I'm not leaving them anything. If I have anything at the end, I'm not leaving them anything. It's all going back into the Lord's work. So you can see people have two extremes, two different ideas about what the Lord meant. Another thing it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that we cannot have private property. Because in the Bible, it's quite clear that you can own your own property. I was thinking the other day of Exodus 20, verse 15, which is the, one of the Ten Commandments. And God told Moses to tell the people, you shall not steal. Now, that, that command would have absolutely no point to it if people couldn't have private property because you're stealing another man's property. In fact, in Exodus 22, half of that whole chapter is dealing with principles on how to handle uh, private owned property among the people of Israel. But then there's another interesting concept too in the New Testament about that. If I was thinking of this the other day too, in Acts chapter two, when uh, Peter had preached on the day of Pentecost and the 3000 people were saved and they were breaking bread from house to house and they were selling all of their possessions, lay them at the feet of the apostles and the apostles then in turn would distribute that to the poor widows among them. And both in chapter two and in chapter four and chapter five, there is an emphasis that the people owned their own property, but they voluntarily sold it for the good of the body as it was in those days. And I don't think that was intended to be a permanent thing. We don't, we don't all live that way. But the principle I think you have in those illustrations is that you can have private property. So when the Lord Jesus says to us in this passage, do not lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, he didn't mean we couldn't have savings account, that we can't plan ahead, that we can't leave money for our kids. I don't think that has anything to do with what he's saying. Because in the context, what he's really telling us is, he's telling us that we should not store up treasures on earth in the sense that we hoard our possessions to enjoy them selfishly and refuse to help others. I think that's the whole point. I think it's, it's a command against being greedy and being miserly about what we have. He's not talking about the increasing of our possessions, but he's talking about how we view them and how we use them. So when Jesus tells us then that we should not lay up treasures on earth, he's telling us, don't be a hoarder, don't be a miser, don't just whole focus of your life being to get possessions for yourself. So if he says that, then on the other hand, he says, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. So why would he, what does he mean by that? Well, it has to be just the opposite. That laying up treasures in heaven is using all that we have, all of our possessions, money, cars, houses, land, whatever he's given us, we use it for the glory of God. And if we do, in doing that, we're laying up treasure in heaven in the sense that those treasures will be returned to us as rewards that he will give us in the millennial kingdom offered to us at the Bema Seat of Christ. So I think that is such an important principle to keep in mind because we live in a materialistic society. And while wealth is kind of relevant uh, anyway, I mean, some are rich without a lot of money and others are rich with a little bit of money. It just kind of depends on where you're at. And who you're living among. So he's really telling us here that you and I should be forward thinking in terms of eternity and use all that he gives us for his glory. Now, Jesus oftentimes will give reasons. Sometimes he will just tell a parable. And at the end of the parable, he says, if you have ears, listen to what I'm saying. But he doesn't really apply the parable itself. 
but sometimes he does. And in this context, it's interesting that the reasoning behind not laying up treasure on earth is because they're insecure. And that's what he says in verse number 19. He says, where moth, treasures on earth, where moth, rust, and thieves break in and steal. Now, wealth in those days, brothers and sisters, is not like wealth today. In those days, hoarding uh, expensive garments was kind of a mark of wealth. Or having gold, that would be a mark of wealth. Or having lots of land, that would be, uh, that would be a mark of wealth. And so that's the kind of people that he was addressing in this context, because if you have gold, thieves could break in. You keep it in your house. Thieves could break in. Those houses in those days were made out of clay. So it would be easy for thieves to come in. In fact, I read somewhere that those thieves in those days were called diggers because they could just dig through the house and come right in and take your gold away. When Darlene and I were living in Korea, we didn't live in clay houses. We lived in brick houses, but it was the thieves in Korea were called slicky boys. And what they would do in the summertime is if you left a window open in your bedroom, they would put a little tube in and pump sleeping gas in and put you to sleep. And then they would come inside and dig whatever they liked. They weren't called diggers. We call them slicky boys. But uh, Jesus is telling us here that you have gold in your houses. Thieves could break in and steal. If you have expensive clothing, then moths can have a heyday on that, and rust will destroy anything that's made of metal. The word there is literally eating away. So Jesus is telling us that if you lay up treasures on earth, they're very insecure. But if you lay up treasures in heaven, they're very secure. And Jesus will reward us accordingly at the, at the time of the coming kingdom with the beam of seed of Christ. Now he goes on to help us understand that a little bit more by telling us in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then he illustrates that by using this really interesting illustration. The eye is the lamp of the body. Now to the Jew, they understood this. It, it seems a little childish to me sometimes when I read it. But the Jews would have understood the point of this kind of a parable or this kind of an illustration. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. It's almost like, you know, the eye is like the lamp of the body. And, you know, if the eye is healthy, the light is inside. Well, it doesn't really quite work that way in real life. But what he's telling us is that we have we use our eyes for everything that we do. We use our eyes to get up in the morning. We use our eyes to go to work. We use our eyes to cook. We, everything we do involves our eyes. That's true. Blind people can't do it, but they, they learn how to manipulate anyway uh, without having eyesight. But Jesus is teaching a principle here, and the principle is that if we have the right focus and the right ambition, and we view our possessions in light of the way he's teaching us to view them, then our eye will be full of light. We'll have the right focus. But if it's not, if we have the wrong view of our possessions, then obviously we're going to use them in the wrong way. And then he concludes this by the strangest statement in my mind, as I read it, I, I puzzled over this for a lot of years and I, I can illustrate it in a couple of ways. He says here in, at the end of verse 19, he says, if then the light in you is darkness. Now I puzzled over that statement because you can't have light and darkness at the same time. So he says, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, that's a very interesting statement. And I think in context, what he's saying is that the light that we have is our knowledge of how God wants us to view our possessions. And if we lose that perspective, then the light that is in us becomes darkness. So he's really trying to emphasize 
the, the ambition, the focus, our preoccupation by using these illustrations. And then he concludes it in verse 25, by reminding us that there is no way, the logicians call this the law of excluded middle, that you can't serve God and you can't serve wealth at the same time. And the word serve in the context is a word for bond slave. It's not for an indentured servant or, you know, uh, uh, someone who is a housemaid. He's not using that kind of language. He's talking about a bond slave. So he's saying that you cannot serve, cannot be a bond slave to both God and possessions at the same time. Because we'll either love the one and hate the other or be disloyal to one and despise the other. Now, let me just illustrate all that I've tried to share with you with an illustration that show how important it is that you and I need to have the proper focus and realize that the important thing in life is really being rich toward God instead of being rich here on planet Earth. There was this rich man who <clears throat> lived in a valley, a very beautiful valley over somewhere in Europe. <clears throat> and in the same valley, and this man was very, very wealthy. He lived in the very palatial home. He was a lover of horses, so he had lots of horses. And I mean, he had everything that a man could want. And in that same valley, there was a poor man. And this man's name was John. But John was a believer. And John actually was working for the rich man. He'd come up every day and work around his property and take care of his horses. And uh, was, he was a good worker, had a good reputation, John did. And toward evening one day, there was, a, there was a knock at the rich man's house. And he goes to the door and there stands John. And John said, sir, he said, could I visit with you for a little bit? He said, I have something I'd like to talk to you about. So the rich man invited him in, they sat down and and the rich man said, well, John, what, what is it that you wanted to share with me? And John said, well, sir, he said, I had the strangest dream last night. And it was so strange that I felt like I really needed to come and, and tell you about it. So the rich man said, well, what was your dream, John? Well, John said, I dreamed last night that the richest man in this valley was going to die tonight at midnight. And the rich man thought to himself, I'm in good health. You know, I, I have everything that I need can't, can't be referring to me. So John, uh, John said, well, sir, I said, I felt like I needed to share that with you. So John leaves. So the rich man went about his business, but as the day went on, he began to think more and more about what this John had said. So he got a little bit troubled by it. He decided to go see the doctor. So he goes to see the doctor and the doctor gives him a clean bill of health and he returns home, but he's still kind of, you know, time is ticking away. And, you know, he's a little troubled about what John has shared with him. So he actually invited the doctor up for the evening. So they sat around, talked, smoked their pipes together. And as time wore on, the doctor said, well, John, uh, to the rich man, he said, I really need to leave and get home. And, the rich man said, no, could you just stay with him a bit longer? He, he wanted to stay till midnight. And the doctor did. Came five minutes to 12, four minutes to 12, three minutes to 12, two minutes to 12, one minute to 12. And the hand went straight up and his grandfather clock clicked off. He was still alive. And he kind of wiped his forehead oh he couldn't have been referring to me then so the doctor left and the rich man went up to get ready for bed and suddenly there was another knock at the door and he goes to the door opens it up and there stands a young lady in the darkness with a shawl kind of wrapped around her shoulders and uh, she said there she said my mom sent me to tell you that my father john died tonight at midnight. And the rich man began to think, I was rich in material possessions, but John was richer spiritually. 
And when I read that illustration, or heard that illustration from a British missionary, I thought that's a great example of exactly what Jesus was teaching in Luke chapter 12 about the rich man who had, you know, had, his, his land had been very productive. He was going to build lots of barns and eat, drink, and be merry. And God says to him, you fool. Tonight, your soul will be required of you. And the word required there is a bank term. It's like someone calling in a loan. And so I think that that illustration was, was illustrating how important it is for all of us, wherever we are economically. The most important thing is that we'll be rich toward God. Because as we serve him, use our possessions for his glory, live our lives for his glory, we are laying up treasure in heaven. And that will be returned to us, as I mentioned before, in terms of rewards at the Bema Seat of Christ. Now, Jesus goes on, and we're not going to go any further uh, this morning, but the other part of the section we read together has to be viewed in light of what we just read. So when Jesus says, for example, in verse number uh, 25, therefore, I tell you, therefore always links it with what went before. Because God is our heavenly father. And because he wants us to be rich in spiritual possessions and spiritual investments. And because you have a heavenly father who cares for you, don't be anxious about your life, what you're going to eat, about the basic necessities of life. And the word anxious in this context is related to, interestingly, to a German word that means choke or strangle. And so three times over in this passage, in light of what he just taught us, he tells us not to allow our concern, our anxiety to choke us to strangle us emotionally in worrying about our basic necessities of life. Now, in conclusion, I want to share with you, I have a real moral problem with one of these passages. I mean, not that I doubt the word of God, you obviously understand that, but I, I do sometimes that I read certain passages and I think about them in light of the world in which we live. I, I I just have questions. Do, do you raise? Do you have questions sometimes too? Sometimes I. Sometimes when I read John five about, you know, Jesus goes to the pool of Bethesda and lots of people are laying around, they're crippled and have physical issues, but only one of them was healed. I think. Why well, wasn't the rest of them healed? I can't answer that question. I know that then that's the way Jesus wanted to heal. He wanted to heal that particular man. When I read this passage, at the end of the chapter, Jesus said, seek you first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added to you. What are the, these things? The things that he's told us not to worry about, the basic necessities of life, food, clothing, and a place to live. I think about that. I say, okay, what about in North Korea? Where there are believers who literally do not know where the next meal is coming from. And places, and none of them have a place to live. I think, how do I resolve that issue? Because that's a question for me. Well, the only way that I can resolve it in my own mind is this. It can't be God's fault. It can't be God's fault. So whose fault is it? It has to lie with mankind. And some people will have basic necessities because they're frankly lazy. They don't want to work. But sometimes others experience that, like in North Korea, because of an evil dictator, you know, that makes them go out and gather up manure in order to have a little bit of heat or go out and scrounge for food, you know, every day. And sometimes they find it and sometimes they don't. But in the end, in the end, it's not God's fault. And in the end, that verse still remains true. That if we seek the kingdom of God first, then all these things will be added to us. That's pretty deep teaching, isn't it? 
but it is a reminder, brothers and sisters, for us to live our lives on earth in light of heaven. And that's the emphasis of the whole of the New Testament. Live life now in light of the future. And may God help us all to do that. And wherever we're, each of us are economically, maybe the lesson, a couple of good lessons to remind ourselves is number one, how do we get our money? How do we view our money, our possessions, and how do we use them? Sometimes I'm faced with that when I think of giving. Uh, Darlene and I give a certain percentage every month of what the Lord provides for us during that month. And sometimes I think, well, how much am I really keeping back for myself? Should I be giving more to the Lord? That's one way the Lord has challenged me as I read this passage. And as you folks think about where you're at, you know, in terms of your own economic income and your lifestyle, what he wants us to realize it's not what we have that's most important, but how we view and how we use those possessions. That's what he's looking for. And that's a matter of the heart, isn't it? And so may God help us to use all that we have for the glory of God. Father, we thank you this morning for your word really is searching and really deep principles that you're trying to help us understand and as for grace to view our lives in light of eternity. Pray that you'll help us in light of the cross to give all that we have to you and recognize that all that we do have is a trust that you've given to us. And in the end, I guess, Lord, it's really not our money. It's not our possessions. They belong to you. So help us to use them for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.